Father, thank you. Thank you because tonight you will move here in your power. You will release fresh dimensions of your grace. You will release new workings of your spirit. Blessed be your name, our Father. We give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Hallelujah. Celebrate the Lord. Celebrate the Lord. And take your seats in his presence. What a privilege and an honor to stand before the God of all the earth and bring him worship, and bless his name, and love on him. Hallelujah. Glory to God forever. What a joy, what a joy, what a joy. Amen. We thank God for all of our friends, all of our partners, everyone who is in the house. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. I hope we're not tired of thanking God for Pastor Patrick and Pastor Francis. Are we tired of thanking God for them? Come on, give them a great God bless you. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Are you ready tonight? I hope you came ready. Amen. You know, this is the last phase of this flight. Tomorrow, um, we'll expect the move of the Spirit. Amen. We'll just expect the move of the Spirit. So that the Lord can, by the sign or the seal of the Spirit, just perfect all that He has done with us. So this is like the last leg of this flight. And so I'm trusting the Lord to help me so, so that nothing the Lord will have you know is left untouched. Amen. Hallelujah. Needless to say, but needless to say, I believe that you know now that um, when this conference is done, you are going to go and sit down with these messages and tear them into tiny little bits and pieces. Amen. That's when it becomes truly effective in your life. There's so much to unpack in, in these things that we have said this number of days. Amen. So tonight I'll be speaking to you about the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So go back with me. I think this will be where we closed yesterday. Romans chapter 5. <clears throat> I illustrated it yesterday, so I'm trusting the Lord that we will not stay too long on Romans chapter 5. Give me from verse 12. Romans chapter 5. Amen. Amen. Romans 5 from verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world. Have I? Uh, look at me for a moment. Have I taught you about the like us principle here? Have I not mentioned it? Oh, really? Okay. There is a principle I find. I, I've taught it before, right? Uh -huh. Thank you, sir. Maybe you listen to it online or something. But I, I think I should have taught it here. Not here. Okay. Some people sound very sure that I've not taught it here. So let, let's just teach it. Even if I've taught it before. Amen. Praise God. All right, so one day I was studying and the Lord, the Holy Spirit said to me, be careful with the like and the us of scripture. And the moment he said it, everything changed. I mean, every, suddenly the, the scriptures just opened in front of me. He said this to me. He said, the moment the word like or us is used, you lose the right to determine extent. You will get it, all right? The moment you see the word like in scripture, or you see the word as in scripture, you lose the right to determine extent. That means that the measure of success is always hidden behind the word like or as. And any time you don't study the word like or as, you determine what it means for a project to have been successful as far as scripture is concerned. I'll give you an example, you get it. Habakkuk 2.14, and the knowledge of the glory of the Lord shall cover the earth as the waters cover the seas. That means the work is not done as far as God is concerned. Scripture didn't say the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth. He didn't leave it that way. If he said it that way, it would have been all right. Then you would have looked around and said, well, every part of the earth has got some modicum of the knowledge of God. But he told you how it will cover it. He said, as the waters cover the sea. Now, what part of the sea is not covered by water? None. That means, by the vision of Habakkuk, listen to this, 
a day is coming when every surface of every part of the surface of the earth will be submerged under the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. That means that if I believe that God has assigned me to display the knowledge of his glory, then I cannot rest until the ass is complete. Oh, uh, did you get it? Did you get it? I will, let, me, let me give you the one that is a bit tougher. It's, 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 this one is slightly tougher. I, I always avoid it first, but let's try. You will love one another as I have loved you. What does like and as do? They make you lose the right to determine the extent. That means the commandment is not love one another. You would have, in the moment the commandment is love one another, I've done my best. Uh, come on. <laughs> Can anybody love you better than what I've done? The moment he introduced the word us, you lost the right to determine the extent of love that must come out of you. That means, if I have not loved you to the degree to which Jesus has loved me, I still owe you. That means I cannot claim to be a champion of love until I love as Jesus has loved me. Getting interesting? Let me jump ahead of myself to say this so that you understand it. The only way it is possible is the candlestick connected to the tree. If the candle tree is not connected to the tree, if the candlestick is not connected to the tree, there is no way the candlestick will produce at the level of the tree. Do you understand it? Now, let me show you that you are Christians. This is what Christians do. Every time Christians hear scripture, we hear because we are frustrators of God's grace. I'm coming there. That one I must do it today. Because we are frustrators of God's grace, every time we hear scripture, what we're hearing is demand. God expects that every time you hear what sounds like the demand of scripture, you should rejoice because scripture is not demand, it's supply. So you don't understand grace. This is the reason why you don't understand grace. If I get up and I say, uh, Charity, so <laughs> you're in trouble with me on this trip, I tell you. If I get up and I say, Charity, I, I know you love me. Uh, and Chairman has permitted you to love me the way you do. Uh, and sincerely right now, the only need I have is that I need a house. And the house has got to be beside Birkingham Palace. And so the cost of that house, I don't know how, how much, somebody give me an estimate in pounds. I, I don't live around here. Eh? Let's say a million pounds, right? So it's, it's a million pounds. So, maybe, right? More, right? So let's, give me, give me a figure, give me a figure. 30 million, 5 million, 25 million. Okay, so let's keep that 25 million. Let's keep it, let's keep that 25 million pounds. Charlie, 25 million pounds. To prove that you love me, you have to buy me a house beside Birkingham Palace, and it's 25 million. Now, Christians hear demand. And so suddenly her heart fails because even if she feels love towards me, she knows that there's the absence of the ability to reveal love at the level at which I demand love. But God never places demand on men. So if God says to you, I want a house beside Birkingham Palace, if you check properly, he has signed a check. No, 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 no. And that check will not be 25 million. Because grace is never enough. It is always more than enough. So if God showed up and said, I want a house beside Birkingham Palace, what you'll be hearing is not demand, so it cannot weigh down your heart. You will get excited because you now know that my account is about to handle monies that it has not seen before. 
I can't boast that I bought God a house. That's how you know his grace. But at least my account can boast that eh, 35 million pounds passed through. Not because I have labored for 35 million pounds, but because the moment the Lord speaks what sounds like a demand, he is telling you the amount of resource he has left for you. So the moment, listen to this, and this will revolutionize your productivity. The moment the Lord reveals a possibility to you, don't think, Lord, what? You, you realize the Lord Jesus was speaking, and then somebody said, God, this is a hard thing. The reason is because the fallen nature makes us hear from the standpoint of demand. The fallen nature interprets everything from the standpoint of demand. And in fact, that fallen nature interpreting things from the standpoint of demand is what scripture calls frustrating the grace of God. You want to see it? Galatians 2. You want to see it, right? Do you want to see it? You will see how many times, how many times in your life, how many projects God set in front of you that you would have done excellently and stresslessly. Galatians 2, 20 said I've been crucified with Christ. Yes, that's what I'm looking for. Galatians 2, 20, right? Is that Galatians 2, 20? Put for me on the board, please. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet, not I. But Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of, not by faith in. Ooh. Listen to this. I am crucified with Christ. That means I reckon myself dead, right? Nevertheless, I'm alive. Yet, it's not me that is alive. Who is alive? Christ is living in me. That means this guy is a dead man walking. Somebody else is using his body. That means this guy is possessed. Somebody else is taking advantage of his members. So you see, it wasn't Satan who started this. Possession was God's idea. <laughs> Look at this. So he said, and the life I live now in the flesh. That means my external life. So that you are not thinking of. I live it not by faith in the Son of God. I live it by the faith of the Son of God. The faith of the Son of God means that. Please, forgive this statement. It's not entirely true, but for the sake of this illustration, you need to hear it this way. I live by the faith of the Son of God means that right now as I'm living, I don't need faith to live. Jesus has faith. When he has faith, I use the faith he has had to live. At that point, everything he says I can do, I can do it. Because I don't need to think whether I can do it. Is the faith of the Son of God I'm living through. Amen. So, if he looks at me and says, this useless, small, plateau state boy can turn the world around for good. I don't need to have faith in what he said. I don't say, he says to me, okay, let's go. I live by the faith of him. So, if he has faith enough to elect me, I just go. If he has faith enough to choose me, I just go. If he has faith enough to reveal it to me, I just go. You will soon see that that, that, that space between what he intends and when I come alive, when, I, when I'm thinking, can I do this? That frustrates God's grace. You'll see it. It's written there. You'll see. You'll see it. Christ will listen to me. Right? And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith 
of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That means he made an exchange between him and me. So that now he can live and live through me. Right? Verse 21. For if righteousness comes by effort, then Christ died in vain. That means if I still have to exert effort to do what Christ wants me to do, then he died for nothing. That the reason why he died is so that he can incarnate me. And if he possesses me, then he can possess all my faculties, then whatever he wants to do, he can do it. And at that point, if I engage my reasonability to start to quantify whether I have the ability to do what God says I should do, I become a frustration to the grace of God. That means that the ability to do it was present. The moment you triggered thought, you suspended the ability. So, yeah, it's like, have you ever seen people on the racetrack? Runners on your marks. Get set, and they were ready to go. And pow! But somebody took off before the gun. And then they tell them, race is cancelled. If you see the, the frustration. Because I came energized. I came ready to fulfill the mission. But the moment you started to think that the mission was about you, you frustrated me. Because God does not permit grace to work in the presence of effort. Because if grace works in the presence of effort, then you have a bit of glorying to do. And if it is grace, you remember, did we read it out of um, Philippians 2? Verse 7. Philippians 2, 7. Yeah, no, Ephesians 2, 7. Ephesians 2, 7. Ephesians 2, 7. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 7. No, that's Philippians 2 7 then. I hope so. Now, why am I doubting? Philippians 2 7. Please check it for me. Check it for me. Check it for me. Check it for me. No, 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 no. No, no, no. It's Ephesians 2. Let me use my Bible. Something's wrong with your Bible. <laughs> oh, you got the joke. You did. Yes, Sorry, 2 8. It's the next verse. Ephesians 2 8. Huh? For by grace are you saved. Uh -huh, through faith, yes. And that not of yourselves, yes. But it is the gift of God. Uh huh, uh huh. Not of works, lest any man should boast. So the moment you introduce works, you frustrate grace. Where will I see the money? Frustrate grace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you heard me right now, massive projects are about to bust out of this place. Because all that will be required is for the Lord to say, I need you to do this for me. And the moment he says, I need you to do this for me, you know that you are incarnated. It is Jesus who wants to fulfill this project. I only have the privilege of being the conduit of translating the project in his heart to the natural. So, and that's the reason why he died. He died so that he can incarnate many people and do many things at once. So imagine what the absence of the understanding of grace has stolen from us for many years. I believe, sir, that that's what the Lord was introducing Livingston Assembly to when he said the things he said at the beginning of the year. Because how will a church this small get up and say, we can change Scotland? No, no. By what? Please, by what index? If we all started to give our salaries every month for the next two years for Project Change Scotland, so we didn't do anything else with our lives, we just gave all our salaries for the next two years, how much of Scotland can we affect? How much? Not much. 
very insignificant. But the Christ who incarnates us says, I have made a choice in Livingston. I have made a, church, a, a choice in the church in Livingston. And I have chosen her as a token to declare to the ends of the earth that out of that which is despised can come forth strength enough to change the ends of the earth. The moment Jesus says that, don't think how, rejoice first. Because it is not a statement of demand, it is a statement of supply. It means because if it was grace that worked it, at the end of the day, everyone will know, no man can do the things that you have done, except God be with you. Listen, Grace is a possibilitarian. I mean, grace just makes everything possible. If there's any caution in grace, it will be who initiated the project. Because you see, God does not commit grace to projects you initiate. God commits his grace to the projects he instructs. That's why understanding, knowing the voice of God, knowing the times and the seasons of God, knowing the demands of God becomes, listen, it does not become a burden because you know, this is the only way I can get up and fulfill everything God wants me to fulfill. It is because of the concept called grace that God never gives you a, an assignment you have ability for. It's because of the concept of grace that God never gives you an assignment that you have ability for. But let me, hear you, let me say this to you. God can give you an assignment that is bigger than you. And you can manage to, by faith, accept that assignment and reduce it to the size of what you can handle. Hmm. I wish you heard me. God can look at you and give you an assignment according to his dream. If you manage to not say no, because the natural thing is that the moment you see the size of a God vision, you tell him, no, 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 no I can't do this. And God doesn't have a problem with you saying, I can't do this. He has a problem with the state of heart that says, I can't do this. I can't do this. I, I, have I ever said this to you? It was the same statement Zachariah made that Mary made. Same statement. Zachariah collected dumbness for his statement. Mary received strategy for her statement. Because the statement was not as important as the state of heart that declared the statement. In Zachariah's state of heart is, Lord, oh, this thing is impossible now. I believed you for how many years? You didn't come when I was still alive. You waited for me to finish dying. Now that there's no strength inside my seed, then you are coming to tell me that I'm about to give birth to a child. How now? So how can these things be? Seeing that I'm old and well stricken in age. Gabriel said, Zachariah, do you know who's talking to you? I. He didn't talk about the Lord. No. Zachariah said, Gabriel said, I am Gabriel. No, wait, 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 wait. Let me tell you the meaning of I am Gabriel. Gabriel wasn't telling him his profile. Gabriel was saying, when God called me to give me this message, not too many angels can stand when God speaks. Even I, it's not like I am designed to stand when he speaks. But because of my ranking among angels, he empowers me to stand so that I can hear this. I said, he said, do you know what it took for me to bear the power of the presence of his voice to collect the message I brought to you? Then that kind of God in whose presence everything trembles tells you that you will give birth to a child. Then you are telling him you are 70 something. Shut up. Because if you don't keep quiet now, you will see another thing that will damage it. You will soon frustrate the grace that I brought to you. Say so you will be dumb. 
and you will not speak until this is. Ah. Do you realize that the next speaking of Zechariah agreed with God? Yeah. The moment he wrote his name is John. His mouth opened. He was not telling them the story of what happened in the temple. He began to prophesy. He started to speak about the things that God ordained for John. At that point, that nine months of silence was sufficient to bring him to see things the way God sees them. Sometimes what you want to pray is, Lord, quieting me so that the possibilities I see in my mind will not take me away from what you plan to deliver to me. Are you following me? Especially for those of us who are male. One of our greatest undoings is how, how much we calculate things. We just we calculate things. If we set out to do this project now, how much will be left for the family every month? Just 500 pounds. Hey, we'll die. Oh. School fees. Ah, he, ah, he. By the time you finish the calculation, by yourself, you shut the project. The first thing you want to do when there's a project in front of you is to ask, who sent this? Is this me or this is the Lord? If it is you, I advise you, think everything you need to think, calculate properly. <laughs> calculate pro If it's you, you see that house you want to build. If it's you that want to build it, you are not sure it's the Lord. Calculate your income. Save according to what you need to build. But if you know, if the Lord says to you, I want you to build me a house that will receive my servants when they walk into your city, he cannot do it with your money. Don't do it with your money. What he actually just said to you is, there's a new stream of inflow I have sent in your direction for that particular project. I require your yes before the inflow begins to come. Because if your yes comes after the inflow, then it is not of faith. It cannot glorify me. Because whatever is not done of faith is sin. The moment you understand it, you, oh, so imagine how much of the grace of God we lost. Because the grace was running in our direction as like a flood. And then we lacked the faith to trigger it because we looked at the level of the demand and we didn't turn around to see the supply that was coming like a flood. And that supply is not seen with sight. That supply is seen with the eyes of faith. So it was the voice of God. So Mary, now let me ask you, what is more impossible for a person who is old to conceive or for a woman who has never been with a man to conceive? What's more impossible? It is actually more impossible for a girl who's never been with a man to conceive. Because a woman, no matter how old she is, there still is traces of a womb there that has known what it means somehow to exercise itself in some incubation ability. Even if she never got to conceive as it were. The girl who has never been with a man said, Lord, how, how do you undo this? Because you know I've not been with a man. And being with a man is the natural way we've been taught a person can be with child. And I'm not saying that because I need to be with a man. I'm saying, you are God. You didn't make the first man from the womb of a woman. And if you didn't make the first man from the womb of a woman, if you choose by me to display an ability that the earth has not seen, just tell me how so I can cooperate with you. How do you know that that was what you were saying? Because the moment the angel said, the spirit of the Lord God shall come upon you and the power of the most high shall overshadow you and that holy thing which shall be born of you shall be called the son of the highest. She said, be it unto me according to your word. So at that point, the definition of possibility is no longer human contact. Bind 
The God who is divine who has made a choice in me for this assignment will together with the choice he has made in me reveal the glory of his grace. You for, don't forget that we said yesterday that grace, the release of grace is the display of glory. So when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dreamed. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the hidden, the Lord has done great things for them. How can the hidden say the Lord? Do you understand it? Because the hidden deny the Lord. But the hidden see something in displaying your life. And they know that this one, the Lord. Listen. I found out in scripture that the Pharisees didn't kill Jesus because they didn't believe in him. They killed Jesus because he was taking away their shine and their glory and he will take away their nation. They said it in John 13. They were afraid that the Romans were going to clamp down their government because of their inability to control the power that is in the hands of Jesus. And they felt that they were too old to submit to that boy. Uh, because who, who busted their bubble? The Bible says there was a man called Nicodemus. Who was a teacher of the law. He came to Jesus by night to find the way of salvation. And he said, he didn't say, Master, I know that that the teacher sent from God. He said, Master, we know. That means when we sit down in pharisaical meetings, we, we talk about these things and it is quite clear to us that the amount of science that you handle, the kind of works you do, our problem is that you are not conforming to the system we set for people. Jesus dealt a dangerous blow on religion. The blow that Jesus dealt on religion, if we understand it, What he did was that he avoided their system because of the limitation their system was going to put around him. Because there will be definitely truths of God that they had not attained unto that he was anointed to display. If you ask me, that's the blessedness of 21st century ministry. The blessedness of 21st century ministry is that the moment you are genuinely, because there is the annoying part that everybody wants to start a church. It's annoying. Many people don't have a business starting a church. Just pick up the branch of a church, sit down there and pastor it. Just, just stay there. Really, just stay there. You see, you see my chairman? Ah, you came milliseconds late. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Dikiti. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, Dikiti ran to town. I saw the way he left. I knew what exactly he was going to go and do. So I was just waiting for you. Then Chairman noticed that I was suffering. Then he just passed it. Then you appeared. Why? Why? Come on, saints. Are you getting blessed tonight? My heart is full of joy. I tell you, my heart is full of joy because of the possibilities that this world will create. Yeah. Amen. Listen, you will... Hey. Say, say you know that you stand in God's presence and you say things like, you move mountains. You cause walls to fall with your power. You perform miracles. There is nothing that's impossible. And we're standing here only because you may. Uh, let me tell you, one day you will sing it, then you will hear God reply you, you move mountains. Oh. You cause walls to fall by my power. You perform miracles. 
and there is nothing that's impossible for you and I am glorified only because you made at that point you will know that your body is the highway of God's glory that's what Isaiah was saying in Isaiah chapter 40 mountains come down valleys feel rough places plain crooked places straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed the Bible says and all flesh shall see it together for flesh to see it it is coming by flesh because flesh and blood does not perceive the divine God so if all flesh see it together it means that it is a flesh like them that's why God chose you and so what God is expecting from you is that you make a way that you become the highway of God that you become the custodian of the glory of God and you do it without apology and yet you do it giving him the glory listen don't apologize for living above the standards of normal men. Let the supernatural become a common place for you. Don't apologize for it. Lay hands on a dying man on the streets. Listen, at the point of desperation, nobody cares what you believe. Everybody is looking for an answer. You cannot be the first to say, call an ambulance. Oh, he's fainting. Can I pray for him? Can I pray for him? They will quickly tell you yes. Because whatever will restore him. And at this point, ah, you lead me in the path of righteousness. For your name's sake. I cannot be standing in front of a man who is dying. In front of the hidden. And declare in the name of Jesus. Come alive. Even for the sake of the glory of his name. The problem is we don't realize that we are God's pathways. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall be made a plain. And they will rejoice to see the capstone in the hands of Zerubbabel with cryings and shoutings of grace, grace. When you understand it, you realize that yielding your members for God to be glorified because at that point you will realize that God does not need more than 10 of us to change Scotland. <laughs> it's at that point. At that point. At that point. At that point. You will realize that God can change the philosophies that have troubled the nation by the manifestation of a kind of people. And you must exercise yourself in these things night and day. And you know, like I said the first time I was here, do it in front of the children. Let them know. This is what we need. Well, we don't have it right now, but let's pray together. Then you hold their hands and pray with them. Don't be a superstar. Don't let them know that God makes a way. Listen, there are some provisions you will enter into for their sake. Because God cannot injure their faith now. Yay! Hey, you know what? We've not been able to pay our mortgage. They just gave us a notice. But you know what? Let's pray. Hold their hands. Stand there and say, Lord Jesus. You gave us this place. You planted us here. We ask that in the name of the Lord Jesus... You send provision for our mortgage. When the provision happens, share the testimony with them. Show them the date of the alert. Because your children must know that God answers prayer. So imagine how many times we frustrated grace. No, no, I told you it's the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we will get there you will see that the idea of grace is of his fullness have we received. That means until we are full of his fullness, he's not satisfied. Oh, the brother that led us to pray, he made reference to certain things I said yesterday. And then he quoted out of 2 Kings, which is true. 
ah, see him, I'm looking for him. Which is true. Because as long as, that's the scripture that made me and my wife friends. We were doing a retreat for a program on campus. And it was, it was a program early on campus, I mean, maybe a hundred level. And I was asked to lead prayer. And I said to them, God has no limitation. He can do anything by us. That we are university students does not change anything. God can do anything by us. Because it is scripture that as long as there is a vessel, oil will keep flowing. If oil stops flowing, the limitation is vessel. It's not source. Because the source will never cease until there's no space in the vessel. That's why I taught you the law of expectation. The moment you stop expecting God to do beyond the level that you believe you can believe him for, it ceases. So, if I ask you, what is the measure of a successful pastor, successful engineer, successful, what is the measure you kept in your mind? You will find out that those are the places where your experiences scarred you and told you it is impossible. And yet, those experiences that told you it was impossible are the things that make you attractive to God. Because scripture said, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, closing he said, see your, you see your calling brethren. Not many of you are great guys. Not many of you are, are orators. Not many of you reach according to the standard of this world. Not many of you noble. Not many of you wise. It's about God chose the foolish things. And the reason why he chose the foolish things is so that he can confound the wise. He chose the base things to confound the things that are noble. The one I love the most, he said he chose the things that are not. How do you choose what is not? The Bible says he chose the things that are not to bring to naught the things that are so that no flesh will glory in his presence. So when he speaks about flesh glorying, he's not only talking about believers. At this point he's saying, if I find a believer who does not glory in himself, what I want to do is I want to end the boasting of the people in the world who glory in themselves. Because don't forget that the stone that the builders rejected, they woke up to find that that stone is the head of the corner. But it's not only the head of the corner. The Bible says it's a rock of offense and a stone of stumbling. And it's a stone of stumbling to everyone who stumbled at the word being disobedient. He said, but unto you that believe, he is precious. Immediately after I said, but yea, are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are a peculiar people chosen to show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Glory to God forever. Understand these saints and then start to see the possibilities of God. Let's pray in the spirit for, for a few minutes. You move mountains, pray in the spirit. You cause the walls to fall with your power. You perform miracles. There is nothing that's impossible. And we're standing here. Only because you made you move mountains. Rodeke barada setia sahaya with your power. Kodi barada gasote dia sahanera erosiata kendo sabako barende sahaya. Rondi gesataya and we're standing here. Only because you made on the car you move mouth Sunday Caparada God your time Ratu Capadosi Daya Rande Sakapa Roscana Tea You perform me Come on see possibilities see possibilities See possibilities see possibilities impossible Rota Caparando Sekabelia Tana Rata Basu de Gatai Erandi Caparasota You will mount You cause 
for possibilities yes, Lord. while we prayed I heard the Lord repeat something in my ear that projects you lost 10 years ago by the mercy of God in this service they are coming back to you in the name of Jesus that every possibility that the frustration of grace took away from you today by the mercy of God and the staring of the waters of God in this place I command them to return to you in the name of Jesus I heard somebody say while I was sitting Lord how do I recover that thing that I lost because you were suddenly seeing that it was not a demand there were supplies that you shut down because you did not believe I got good news for you that project returns to you that instruction returns to you that possibility returns to you in the name of Jesus and tonight we celebrate recovery we celebrate recovery I decree in the name of the Lord Jesus a sevenfold return I decree a sevenfold return I decree a sevenfold return in the name of the Lord Jesus many of you are discovering this evening that your life is not supposed to be where it is I decree in the name of the Lord Jesus in the next three months in the next three months in the next three months let shaking happen let the Lord cause a shaking to happen by the voice of the blood of Jesus let a shaking happen so that everything you lost is recovered in the name of Jesus I decree in the name of the Lord Jesus from here onward only the results of grace will you see only the results of grace will you see oh it will be said among the hidden the Lord has done great things for them thank you father thank you father thank you father oh that opportunity is not lost there's somebody under the sound of my voice two years ago you you tried to be pregnant again you have children but you tried to be pregnant again and you got some report that told you that was impossible right now I restore that possibility to you right now 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 not more than nine months from now you'll have that child not more than nine months from now you will have that child thank you father thank you lord because everything is possible here this is an atmosphere of your possibility thank you lord thank you lord just bless him for a moment take a moment and just thank him 
Thank you. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for the grace that you have given us. We could never repay. We could never repay you, but from our hearts, we like to say that we. Say that again and bless his name. Thank you, oh Jesus. Jesus. Thank you for the grace. For the grace that you have given us. We could never repay. We could never repay you, but from my heart, we like to say. your grace thank you for your grace we have received the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness and by it we reign in this life we have received the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness and by it we reign in this life blessed be your name father Come on, give the Lord a shout of praise. Ooh, ooh, glory, glory, glory. Ah, hallelujah. 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 Ah, hallelujah. Let them rejoice and shout for joy that favor my righteous cause. And let them say continually, the Lord be magnified. Even the Lord who takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Welcome to a day of new prosperity. I said welcome to a day of new prosperity. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Please take your seats in God's presence. Let's finish this quickly. Oh, blessed be God. Blessed be God. If we close here, it's good. True. My heart rejoices. Oh, I rejoice because I see in the eye of my spirit what you will look like not many days from now. My heart rejoices. My heart rejoices. My heart rejoices. Operations are about to change gears. We're entering into next dimensions. Hallelujah. So that operation, that's how grace abounds. That's how grace operates. But something I think is important to show you, Second Peter chapter 1, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Second Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter, yeah, that's it, 1. 
Hallelujah. 2 Peter 1, 2. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus or of Jesus our Lord. Next verse. According as his divine power had given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us to glory. Your calling is to glory. God does not call anybody to shame. By the time you arrive at answering your call, you will be glorious. You become the definition of virtue. Who has called us unto glory and virtue. Whereby are giving unto us exceeding great and precious promises. That by these promises, you might be partakers of God's divine nature, having escaped kept the corruption that is in the world that operates through lust. Please look at this. Very important for me. Verse 2 said, grace and peace be multiplied unto you. Then he said, according as his divine power. Oh, you remember the word as, right? According as his divine power had given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us. That means that all things can be given to you, but you lack them because you do not know the one who has called you to glory. Listen, listen to this. God is glorified to glorify you. I wish you heard me. Don't let anything make you feel like God is conserving how much he wants to glorify you. No, any conservation from the end of God is so that he can finish the work he needs to do in you. So that it, when you are standing in glory, you will not disgrace yourself. Because if God exalts a man, the man is exalted. He becomes visible. And if there's anything unfinished in the man, that thing also becomes visible. Are you following me? God is glorified to glorify you. Now, if you understand that, you know that the target of your life consistently is glory. But the Bible now went on in verse 4 to say to, say to you, I'm coming back to verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you according to the knowledge of him. But the Bible now went on in verse 4 to say to you, whereby I give you unto us exceeding great and precious promise. So that by these promises, we become partakers of God's nature. Having escaped corruption. That means, let's do it illustratively, all right? Let's use this black speaker and the other one there. Every step I take away from here, I take away from corruption, I take towards the divine nature. Every step. And God's intent is to bring me to his divine nature. Are you following me? Yes, I'll show you something that I, you, you possibly, possibly might not have seen. Possibly. Possibly might not have seen. If you read Galatians chapter 6, please find the verse that said, uh, do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked, whatsoever a man sows, that shall live. You remember it, right? If you find that verse, just show me. Uh -huh. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man sows, that shall he reap. Can you see it? Now, look at that verse carefully. You will find that in this verse, it is telling you the outcome of sowing. You sow corn, you reap corn, you sow wheat, you reap wheat, you sow sorghum, you reap sorghum, you sow millet, you reap millet, you sow groundnut, you reap groundnut. You cannot sow rice and expect. That means the outcome of sowing is exactly what you sowed. You sow mercy, you receive mercy. You sow money, you receive money. That's it. But... Pastor Victor, I found out that this was not the important piece of information that Paul was trying to pass. What you sow is not his primary concern. Next verse, he said, if you sow to the flesh, uh -uh. for he that soweth to his flesh, uh -uh -uh. he now moved from what you sow to where you sow. And the wear of sowing is either flesh or spirit. Yes, right. There are only two grounds you sow. Right. You either sow on. Now, listen to this. Good seed 
good action, wrong soil. Produce. Uh-huh. No, no. It reproduces the good action back to you. But together with the good action coming back to you, you will reap corruption. That means you can reap corruption out of a good work. You get it? So if I have a brother in need and a sister in need, and I become more compassionate towards the sister because of my flesh, and I give to the sister, Listen to this. I will repo. Because whatsoever a man sows, he will reap it. So in the day I have need, somebody else will give to me. But together with my reaping comes the increase in the working of corruption. So I just said lost by what looked like a good action. So it is not sufficient that I sowed a good seed. It is also sufficient that I check the intent for sowing the seed. For the fruit of the spirit is love. That means if I sow in the spirit, there will be a singular motivation. is love. And the God kind of love. You now realize what scripture says. If I give all that I have to the poor, and I give my body to be burnt, but had not love, I am nothing. No profit. Why? Because as it is, where you sow is more important than what you sow. That means, listen to this, I can sow a slap and reap a slap and eternal life. That means I can slap you for the right reason. I can slap you onto your salvation. Society might not understand it. Police might arrest me, so I reaped. Do you understand it? So police might arrest me. They might keep me in jail, county jail for like two days, three days. I might pay a high price to bail myself out. But the Lord, who knows the intent of my slap, will cause that together with what I reaped will come a bountiful harvest of eternal life. So what I sow is not as important as where I sow. That means you might not like what I sow, but if where I sowed it is the right soil, if the reason why I did it is the right reason, whether you increase your hatred for me or not, it matters less. Because together with that action, I reap eternal life. Amen. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. And, but he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. Now don't forget that light is a product, product of life. We have, we have established that, right? Uh, in the revelatory phase of this teaching, we established that light is a product of life. That means as eternal life or as the practice and the measure of eternal life increases in us, our actions of grace become a little more natural. It becomes, so as I move more away from corruption in the direction of eternal life, what happens is that I am increasing in the display of grace. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you according to as I move in the direction of knowing God more. What happens is that grace is multiplied more. So it's like someone is increasing the size of the pipes of grace that release from me. As I cleanse myself walking in the direction of knowing God. Now, if you understand that, it then brings us to the place where now we can say to ourselves, what does it take? Uh, what does it then take to become more effective in? 
Second Peter chapter three. Sec more, in, more effective in the display of grace. So Second Peter chapter three, verse eighteen. Scripture says, "But grow in grace." And can you see the same things? Can you see, see the same things? It started with but, so you might need to go back a little bit so that you see why it is saying, but going grace. All right? 14, from verse 14 quickly. But beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found in, he, of him in peace without spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, had written unto you. As also in his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which some things are hard to, under, to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also all the other scriptures unto their own destruction. You therefore, beloved, seeing that you know these things, beware, lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace. That means... You who knows that the end of the world is coming. You who knows that Jesus is coming back. You who knows that all of this rebellion that is happening on the earth is only preparing us for the reappearing of the Lord Jesus. Don't forget that because you live in a body, the error of the wicked can become pleasing in your sight. This is how the Lord Jesus put it. The Lord Jesus said, who is that servant? Whom his master finds him faithful enough to set him over the rest of his brethren. Right? He said, blessed is that man whom when the master returns, he finds him giving those servants bread in due season. He said, but and if that the servant of that man shall say in his heart, my master delayed his coming. Oh, but and if that man shall say in his heart, that means he will not utter it. It is like saying, Kai, Jesus is starting now. Uh -uh. Jesus should come now. Uh -uh. The moment the man says in his heart, my master delayed. <laughs> What happened is that the scripture says that he will begin to eat and drink with the drunken. When he starts to eat and drink with the drunken, he will beat his fellow servants. That's what the Bible says. Matthew 24. It's there. Are you following me? Let me tell you where I'm going to, and I'll, I'll take you back to Second Peter chapter one and show that to you. The moment a man stops growing in grace, he becomes tired in his heart, and he slips into rebellion. He starts to fall away to the error of the wicked. Now, the growth in grace, ah, oh, Lord Jesus, the growth in grace. Let me, let me lay this and then come back here very quickly. If you remind me, there was something I said you push you remind me to come back to yesterday. No? did. Um, I think Andrew tried to remind me. Maybe if you still remind me, I will ask you later. If you still remind me, I'll get back there. Look at this. Growth has got a measure, right? We're standing here yesterday with Jesse and we're standing here yesterday. <laughs> we're standing here yesterday with Jesse and, you know, we're talking about him and his brother and we're saying, oh boy, it looks like you are you are done growing. And he says, no, I, I still got time to grow. And then I realized, okay, yeah, yeah. He's naturally going to keep growing taller until he's about 18, 19. For those of us who are men, it's about 18, 19 that we possibly stop growing taller. Then I realized that until he's 19, we cannot tell his height. Right? And yet, his brother has got a greater opportunity. Because he literally has not even sprung forth out of the ground yet. The moment he springs out of the ground, that Jesse who has gone like this might just watch his brother come like that and pass. Right? And yet, what happens is 
Jesse just becomes possibly a measure for his brother. So that because the same seed produced both of us, every time I look at you, I can tell how far I'm going to grow. You will see where I'm going to. You'll see where I'm going to. You'll see where I'm going to. All right? So, naturally, I asked the... You know, they kept going back and forth, and both of them were saying, uh, no, Zef, you're not going to grow beyond me. And I was looking at them and laughing. Truth is, whatever you say or not say will not stop him from growing, you understand? At the end of the day, he's going to grow. And if it's the same seed that formed them, same seed, if it's the same seed that formed them, naturally, as far as Zef is concerned, every time he looks up and sees Jesse, what he's seeing is not an oppressor. What he's seeing is a future. He's seeing a possibility. You will, you will get it. You will get it. You will get it. You will get it. Except a corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies. It abides alone. Our, but if it dies, it produces much fruit, right? Our original corn of wheat is Jesus. God threw him to the ground and he died. There is no way God will come back to harvest. And when he opens the air, we don't look exactly like the corn of wheat that fell down. At some point in development, that cob does not even look like it's going to produce corn. At some point in development, all that there is is something that looks like a leaf that just broke out that way. And you can look at that thing and say, boo, this corn is wasted. But as surely as that thing is still attached to a stalk and there is still time, it will ultimately grow and when you open it, you will not find one corn. You will find numerous corns, but each one of them has the exact potential of the one that went down. So the concept, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is actually God saying to the Christian, if you look at everything Jesus is, it is not an attempt to intimidate you. It is God leaving for you the possibility of what you look like at the full measure of the display of grace and of his fullness have all we received and grace for grace. So Jesus is not our intimidation. Jesus is our possibility. And as long as we have not arrived at operating at the level of Jesus, we've got to keep growing in grace. Oh, can you see why, why it is? But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you see it? That means as I grow in knowing him, I grow in grace. As I grow in knowing him, I grow in grace. Now, the moment I stop growing in knowing him, somebody else gave me a measure that is not the measure of God. That made me feel like I have achieved something when I've not arrived at standard. It's part of the reasons why the Bible says comparing themselves with themselves, they are not wise. Do you get it? I can walk into the room and feel like, oh, I'm, I'm the greatest celebrity pastor in the room. Oh my God, I'm such an achiever. The foolishness in it is that God did not call me to be a celebrity pastor. He called me to represent Christ accurately. And to the degree to which there's still some measure of Christ I have not yet represented, I must keep growing in grace. So you remember 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 2, if you take me back there, you no, take me to verse 5, right? All right? 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 2 told you, grace and peace be multiplied unto you according to the knowledge of... You see it again? Then he said, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through, our, through the knowledge of him who called us to glory and virtue. He called us to take us to glory. Then he said, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises so that by these promises we become partakers of his nature, the divine nature. Having escaped what? 
the corruption that is in the world. That means we stop being earthly and start becoming divine. Now see what verse 5 said. And beside this, giving all diligence add to your faith virtue. And to virtue knowledge. Stop there. You see, this work that scripture recommends in Second Peter chapter 1 verse 5, this work that it recommends, if you don't engage in that work, you make grace vain. I taught you frustrating grace. Now let me teach you making grace vain. Because those are the two things that believers do to grace that stop the manifestation of grace. If you don't give diligence to add to your faith virtue and add to virtue knowledge, when a believer stops adding, what happens is that he makes grace vain. Let's see it. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 15. Or is that 15, 10? 10, 15. 15, 10, 10, 15. 10, 15. 10, 15. No, 15, 10. 10, 15. Let me find it in my Bible. I think something's wrong with their Bible. It's their Bible that's messing up my head. 15, 10. First Corinthians 15, 10. Can you see it? Mm. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. That means grace can be bestowed upon you, and it can be in vain. Why was it not in vain? But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. So look at this. That means when grace appears... Grace does not appear to retire you. Okay. Let me go back to charity. You remember that our charity example, right? Do you remember that our yes, 35 million example? Yes, sir. So I release the 35 million in that direction. She rejoices and goes and invites chairman and they relocate. <laughs> they move to America. They move to America, buy their own house, and live there. What they have done is they have made grace vain. Because every grace that is given to you sends you to work. Does it make sense? Every grace that is given to you sends you to work. In fact, the knowledge of the undeservedness of grace makes you diligent in work. So God hates work outside grace. But God loves to see a believer working in the place where God has given him grace. And every time a believer receives the abundance of grace and doesn't work it just becomes vain. Oh, let me show you the outcome. Go back to Second Peter chapter 1. Go back there. He kept saying, add, 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 add. Add to virtue, kindness, brotherly kindness, love. Da, 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 da. Then verse 8. Put verse 8. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 8. Same breath of scripture. Second Peter 1 8. Verse 8. Look at this. For if these things be in you and they are bound... That's the things that he kept asking you to diligently add. Because I now have the grace of God, I have to add knowledge. Because I have knowledge, I have to add virtue. Because I have virtue, I have to add temperance. Because I have temperance, I have to add brotherly kindness. So, a man who receives the abundance of grace is consistently checking his life to ask, what do I add so that grace becomes a little more effective? Are you following me? So he said... These things that I asked you to add, if they be in you and they abound, they make that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful. Now, hold on, hold on, hold on. 
Barrenness means the inability to birth. That means you can have grace and not give it. I thought that barren is equal to unfruitful. It's not true. In the context of this scripture, barren and unfruitful are not the same. Fruitful is not to give birth to children. That's not the scriptural meaning of fruitful. Fruitful is to justify the type. Be fruitful, multiply. So multiplication is different from fruitfulness. In fact, until a thing is fruitful, God does not bless it to multiply. Ah, that's why he cursed Michal, the daughter of Saul. What he was saying is, let this type not multiply. The type that sees my praise and despises it, I cannot bless it to multiply. That's the only woman in scripture that God pronounced as barren. And she was barren till death. So a thing has to be fruitful for it to multiply. In fact, if you want to understand the law of the fruit, this one you might need to do later. Go and study Isaiah chapter 5. In Isaiah chapter 5, you'll find out that the Bible says, I write a song unto my beloved, Isaiah 5.1. I write a song for my beloved as concerning his vineyard. He said, my, my beloved planted a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug trenches around it, built it a fence. He dug a watchtower in it. Then the Bible says he built a wine press. Oh! Before he planted the seeds, he had built a wine press. That means God, by reason of investment, has the right to expect harvest. Can you see it? And he made a wine press there in. See the next statement, that's where your heart breaks. And he looked that it should bring forth good grapes. He brought forth wild grapes. So it actually brought forth grapes, but the grapes were wild. Let me tell you the truth. It's better to be barren than unfruitful. Because when you become unfruitful, you will be generating energies that will be anti-God. Sir, this grace that I carry can be the reason why I'll be snatching people's wives. It's fruit. It's just not according to the type that was sown. Oh... You get it? This grace that I carry can be the reason why I'll be robbing people of their possession. Before I entered into ministry, I read the speech of Samuel when Israel rejected God. Because God said they did not reject you as prophet. They rejected me as their king. Samuel stood and he said, is there any one of you that I've ever taken advantage of? Is there any one of you I've ever... When he finished, the Bible says, and all Israel said in one voice, there's not. So a man can live his ministry life from start to finish and nobody has a charge against him. When I read it, it puts some... I always remind myself that I only became this beautiful because of the grace of God. I remind myself what I looked like before the grace of God found me. Uh -huh. So if you hear, singing majesty, majesty, your grace has found me just as I am. Empty handed but alive in your hand. Singing majesty, we singing majesty forever. I am changed by your love in the presence of your majesty. If you remember where he picked you from. You see that scripture we just left. 1 Corinthians 15. For it is by the grace of God I am what I am. Take us back. Read verse 9. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 9. The verse before it. You will hear Paul say. And unto I who am less than the least of all apostles. 
Is it true that Paul is less than the least? No, 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 no. You, you think about it. We just read Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3. He told you that the display of the knowledge of the end was not in any of the apostles like it was in Paul. And he said it is unstable and foolish people that wrestle with what Paul said. That's Peter, the one Jesus gave key. Then when Paul was going to talk about himself, he said, for I am the least of the apostles. That I'm not meant to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. What Paul was speaking of in 21st century new creation language is that he's living in his past. That's New Testament language. That's, that's new creation realities language. Paul is living in his past. He's not letting his past go. You are not who you were. No! I am who I was until the grace of God found me. And I must be consistently reminded of it. If not, I will become unfruitful. And I told you that unfruitful is not the absence of fruit. It is that you did not justify the type of fruit that was put inside of you. So he planted on a very fruitful hill. Then he looked forward to receive sweet grape. And then he received wine. You see his grape, he still collected it. Listen, so that you don't think I'm only talking to preachers. That's how certain millionaires are spending our money on vacation. I wish you heard me. Because if God gave you the gift of grace of giving, it means that you must be responsible enough to understand that until grace found me, I was not this productive. That's why the Bible told you that you must honor God with your first fruit and the fruit of your increase. So that as you increase, add honor to God in it. If not soon, you will start to think, man, I'm a very wise guy. I'm a sharp guy. That's why I got that contract. I'm a sharp. What you did not know is that it was grace that elected you. Everything you did failed until grace found you. And you must account for it as a gift of grace. If you don't, what will happen is that you'll be fruitful. But your fruitfulness will be called unfruitful. Because what you'll be producing would be wild. So fruitful in scripture is not that you produced. No, no, no. Fruitful is that you justified the type. What is the type? Jesus is the type God gave. The product must justify the type. Then it is at multiply that you begin to reproduce. So multiply is reproduce. Be fruitful is justify the type. That's why you must diligently add. Come on, come on. That thing I just did, does it look like Jesus? Oh, let me add virtue there. Uh, this I did. Kai, 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 kai. I just loved myself. I need to add brotherly kindness. So take us back to that scripture in 2 Peter chapter 1. If these things be in you, verse 8, and they are bound, they make that you are neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge. Oh, please give, give me that scripture. 2 Peter 1 8. They make that you are they make that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. See verse 9. Look at this. But he that lacks these things, though he's born again, he's blind. He cannot see afar off. And he will quickly forget that he was purged from his old sins. That means he will go back to living according to his old sins. Do you remember what we read in Matthew chapter 24? If that servant shall say in his heart, my master delays is coming. The next thing you will see is that he will begin to eat and drink with the drunkards and then he will start to beat his fellow servants. Give us 10 and 11. I'm quickly coming to a close now. Wherefore the rather, brethren, the word comes back again. Give what? Diligence to make your calling and your election. There are two different things. Your calling is what he did before you were born. Your election is the point he met you and he ordained you into doing the things that you were born to do. Give all diligence. Say, God, 
I was not that wise. You chose me. Kai, I will justify your calling. What I like about this scripture is the last statement. He said, if you do these things, you will never fall. Did you see the guarantee of scripture? That means it's possible to never fall. But a man who never falls is consistently in motion. In this kingdom, a man who never falls is consistently in motion. If he stops to consider the wicked and their ways, Second chapter 3 told us, he will slip into the ways of the wicked. And then he will be judged by the same damnation. But if that man understands that, see, the only duty given to me is I must justify the grace of God. And you remember like as principle, as Jesus is, so am I. As he is, so am I. As he is, so am I. And as surely as scripture said, as he is, so am I. It means I cannot stop until as he is, so am I. That means every potential to be Jesus. Oh. God gave us the potential to be and do everything Jesus was and did. And if that is our potential, we keep moving to justify the potential. Oh, one of the things that you must see in your working of grace is never make a mistake that you made here make you believe that God did not elect you. Some of the things that ended the journey of many people, heaven did not even consider it a mistake. It was religion that killed them. I'll explain it to you and you'll get it. You understand it. You understand it. Pastor, there are certain things John will do that you rejoice at that Zeph cannot do. You try to make sure that John is consistently tied in a nappy because John cannot refuse to sleep in the night because he peed in his nappy. Do you understand? He will sleep in fact, it's his right. To pee in his nappy. It's, I mean, it's his right. If you woke up in the night and found that Zeph or Jesse. Okay, guys, let me tell you something. Zeph, you know, that's, that's the benefit of being the pastor's child. You are always in the examples. I, I told my son, my daughter came to me with a video said they said i'm a pastor's kid and of course all of my secrets are in the public <laughs> and she brought it to me i told her, i said my friend will you get out of here <laughs> whose secrets do you want me to take to the public so i asked her don't you hear me share my secrets you i share your, your mother's secrets who are you <laughs> now, now get, get this so if you wake up at night and Zeph or Jesse have their beds wet, I mean, it's either we're calling the doctor asking, are you all right? Are you? you see, John John is here. And God does not condemn him. God considers it a part of his process that he made certain mistakes. The psalmist said in Psalm 103 that he has not held our sins against us, neither does he chide us. He said he remembers our frame. He knows that we are dust. That means God only expects to the degree to which he has converted dust to divine nature. The work God has not done inside of you, he's not producing fruit for. He's not expecting fruit for. 
So when you, if you stumble at that point and you sit down on the ground and you are crying, you are thinking, I'm not worthy. God is looking at you and thinking, you are proud. <laughs> but there's somebody else who's here. Yeah. Oh God, God is not expecting. By now, we should not be discussing that means that what you must, part of the things you owe yourself is to know where you are in the journey. And one of the things, oh Jesus, this is liberating. I sense the spirit of liberty in this house. This is liberating because listen to this. How you will know is that whether you fell here or you fell here or you stumbled here, your heart towards God is pure and innocent. You are willing to repent and get up and go again. Don't ever let Satan by guilt, shame, or condemnation make you stranded in a place. The idea is to stop you from moving. Because the moment you stop moving, you start producing after the order of the flesh. Satan does not defeat a Christian because the Christian fell. Satan defeats a Christian because the Christian refused to rise up. Amen. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. But be thou forever near me my master and my friend I shall not fear the battle if thou by my side no wonder from the pathway he So every promise we make to God is dependent on his presence to fulfill. So when we vow before the Lord, we are vowing on his strength. Not on ours. So you hear the same songwriter said, Oh, let me feel the near me. The world is heavenly. He said, I see the sights that dazzle the tempting sounds I hear. Then he said, My foes are ever near me. They are around me and within me. But Jesus, draw down nearer and shield my soul from sin. He said, Oh, let me hear the speaking in accents clear and steep above the storms of my passions the of self will oh speak to reassure me to Control me, oh, speak and make me listen, thou guardian of my soul. What I require at every point in this movement is to be sure the Lord is near me. Jesus said to the woman, Where are your accusers? He said, oh, they do not condemn you. He said, neither do I. Then he said to her, go and sin no more. Let me tell you what the problem is. When you heard go and sin no more, you thought he was warning her. You thought you were saying to her, don't do that again. No. That I forgive you does not mean that you should go back and continue doing what you are doing. No, that's not it. He does not place demands. He supplies. Oh. 
So when he said to her, go and sin no more, he was transferring an ability into her that makes that the next time she sees that kind of situation, she knows what to do to live above it. Same thing scripture said in Hebrews chapter 4. Come boldly unto the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy. Then what do you say? And find grace to help in the time of need. That means that if I came because I failed, I will receive mercy. But I should not receive mercy and leave. I should also receive grace so that when I go back and what made me come to take mercy shows up. Grace is now present to help me in that time of need. Oh, this is such a wholesome teaching. Because it makes that there's no place Satan can get you. He can't get you to slow down. And even if you fall, he cannot use guilt, shame, and condemnation to hold you there. Don't ever let Satan use something in your history to define you. Don't. Don't. Let me tell you something. Especially if your history has evidence. No, some guy you lived a wild life in. Now that you stood up and you're about to, you lived a wild life with him. Maybe come to him for like seven, eight years. He knows everything about your life. Then now you are rising up. It's now that you are becoming pastor. Then the guy shows up. <laughs> then he calls you by the name he used to call you 12 years ago. That's how you identify Satan. Yes, sir. Answer him quickly and tell him I'm not that person. Amen. Whoever is in Christ, a new creature. That's not me. That's not me. See, whatever you are not willing to do now that you did before is not you. It's not you. Nobody has the right. Unfortunately, religion seems to delay us because many times we are still counting those things against people. So we don't permit them the liberty to serve God. Amen. Tonight I came to set you free. Amen. Just enter into the liberty that Christ has made you free. Don't be held back. Oh, I see Satan falling. Believe me. I know what it meant for Jesus to stand and say, I see Satan falling like lightning from heaven. I see him falling. I see him. I see him falling. I see him. Because everything that will have restricted you, we have found it. We have shined the light there. And that means that there's nothing that's holding you back. Nothing. Nothing can't. Nothing ever will. If these things be you and they are bound, they make that you are neither barren, non fruitful. So, but the one who forgets that he has, he has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sin, he has slipped back into his old ways. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, giving all diligence to make your calling and election so. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. Then verse 11 said, For so shall an entrance be granted unto you into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He said, if you do this one, this is how you will rule together with Jesus. It's an entrance into the everlasting kingdom. Ruling with Jesus is not the same with making heaven. It's not. Is he that overcometh? He that overcometh. It's not he that escaped. It's not he that survived. It's he that overcomes. It's he that overcomes. Listen to me, saints, as I begin to close. Let's close on Romans chapter 5. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, my heart is so full of thanks. Please bless the Lord with me. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Please do it freely. 
Just magnify the Lord with me. Uja dea rati ke barondi gista pa ilati janate e graba da batu pasaki anda sahali ata reti gabrande sudi ata shabagadi abadate radi baso ke la dia shara manate ke bayana redi azola shakabado dia shada bato te begaina ata rabadi aboko so se bedi shada bagaina radi aboko boso dia basata e alagadi abasa Aina mira radega balani abagaso se bedi ashata tae. Worthy, you are worthy. King of kings, Lord of lords, you are worthy. Worthy, you are worthy. King of kings, Lord of lords, I worship you. Say it again. Worthy, you are worthy. King of kings, Lord of lords, you are worthy.
bow before your wisdom and your majesty we bow before the order of your precepts we bow before the wisdom that created all things we bow before the hand that formed all things we surrender oh god to the magnificence of your will and your intents none is as good as you are who will create for his pleasure and yet decide that our fulfillment is in your pleasure we bless you thank you for the privilege in time to know you thank you for the privilege in time to walk with you thank you for the privilege in time to be called by your name we love you ancient of days blessed be your name thank you in jesus name and all god's people said amen Hallelujah. 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 He's worthy of our praise. 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 I think we'll stop here today. My heart is too full to teach. Oh, you don't know how thankful I am. You don't know how thankful I am. Not just that God found me and found me worthy to teach these things, but I'm standing and I'm looking at Livingston and by implication the cities around it. Because I'm believing that this word will produce a hundredfold. And I know what this place will look like when it produces and my heart is thankful because this room is the room of God's election that you are sitting in this room right now means that you are the elect of God you are elected unto this purpose you are elected unto this purpose there is no carelessness in the choice of anyone in the room not even the tiniest little baby you will see how our lives are implicated by this that the future of this move is seated in this room right now that the fathers and the sons will plow the same fields you think that our children are uninterested no they are under the rain the same rain is running upon them and you will see it not many days from now their shoulders will bear the burden of God they will be called his resting place this is the generation that seeks you that seeks your face oh Jacob As we gather, may your spirit walk within us. As we gather, may we glorify your name.
Say one more time and let thanksgiving rise from your heart. We are so blessed because we can. We are so blessed because we can. Lord, this is the room of your elect. Lord, thank you because you have made a choice in this room to take over this city and the cities round about it. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your fragrance rising from here and releasing grace and glory. Oh, the Lord our God is a sun and shield. He gives grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Lord, nothing is withheld from us. We go in the liberty of the Spirit, making known the savour of your fragrance everywhere. I dare to say to you, the levels of your operation have changed. You can never be the same again. You can never be the same again. You will find greater grace and you will be received with greater glory. The prophet Jeremiah said that in the same place where Zion was despised and they said this is Zion, this, this is, he said in that place the Lord will multiply us and we will not be few. The Lord will glorify us and we will not be small. God will not have to move you to glorify you in the same place where they said. The prophet Jeremiah said, upon the ashes of that real, God will glorify. Lord, we open up a season of glory. A season of glory. Your people step into your glory. They manifest your glory. Thank you, Father. Our hearts are full of thanks. One more time, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Magnify the Lord. Let us exalt his name together. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord.